Um, before we get started, I just wanted to recognize, again, there's just so many people to recognize in terms of um, our ability to uh, uh, do this event, to hold this event. Um, it really is a team, a, a team effort. And another um, entity that I, I want to recognize that's been a long-term supporter of the organic community and work in general um, that we do at University of Wisconsin-Madison is Albert Lee Seed. Uh, and Albert Lee Seed uh, provided resources um, and uh, people to, to help organize this event, um, helping with the registration table, but just want to recognize the incredible support of Albert Lee Seed um, in their, their sponsorship and their um, really hands-on help in terms of making this event happen. So I know they're exhibiting, but have been inc incredible, incredible uh, supporters throughout the years, not only of UW-Madison, but, but also of the organic community. And uh, just a ton of ton of knowledge within that um, within that company. All right, so I'm gonna really pull you guys back in um, again. Conversations, if you want to go outside, but but let's uh, focus our attention on our amazing keynote. We are so happy to um, welcome back Klaus Martins. Klaus was a keynote several years ago at an O'Grain conference, and he's just one of those people that you can listen to for hours because the uh, depth of knowledge of uh, this farmer is is just amazing on so many different topics so just so thrilled to have Klaus join us um, in addition to several other New York farmers so just a quick introduction of Klaus Klaus Martins is a third generation grain and livestock farmer in upstate New York and an organic no-till veteran he and his wife Mary Harrell Martins began farming organically in the 1990s and were the first in the area to do so organic farming gave them a profitable way to put diversity back on the farm and now many of their neighbors have followed suit. Klaus is a thought leader and frequent public speaker about the organic movement. And I, I will say, and Klaus is so generous with his time and knowledge and often serves on um, different uh, boards, including um, related to soil health, which organic representation is critical. So just, just so grateful in terms of his leadership, um, not only within the organic community, but representing organic um, in other aspects of agriculture. Uh, they operate the Martins Farm and Lakeview Organic Grain Mill along with their son Peter and produce corn, soybeans, spelt, wheat, emmer, einkorn, rye, triticale, buckwheat, oats, barley, cabbage, dry beans, hay, and a wide range of other crops. And the mill ships organic feed and seed to multiple states. Um, and I will say they have some really cool things not only happening with that diversity and organic no-till but technology as well, having been able to, to visit his farm last summer. Um, and the Martins family is committed to growing the organic community, and their motto is, we all do better when we all do better. So please join me in welcoming Klaus Martins. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I like Wisconsin. It's a lot like New York. So maybe I'm uh, egocentric there. but uh, We were... Probably an unlikely uh, candidate to be organic farmers originally. I went to um, the land grant system and learned how to farm. Uh, my parents were European peasant farmers, and when I was a kid, I thought that they were the most backward farmers there were in the world. And I went to college and learned how to farm right. And we brought all the inputs on the farm and had the Green Revolution overnight. And I have to say, our yields went up. And they went up pretty uh, drastically, and things worked really good. But there's a little more to the story. Uh, my mother was one of those uh, iron grandmothers who uh, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. So she let us go ahead and start using the chemicals, but she had a condition. She said, you keep records, and you keep very good records, and you show that it actually makes sense. And that was, that was one of the best things that ever happened, of being required to justify the changes. So yes, we saw the yields go up, we saw the responses, but what we didn't see right away was that there were more things happening than just the yield of our crops. Unbeknownst to me, our soil was changing. So I'm going to take you back in time 
if you go back to the early days before uh, we had terms like organic, agriculture was not sustainable. If you go back to the 1930s, we had the Dust Bowl, we had real problems on the land. There was a reason farmers were, being, were having to leave their farms. And we often get the criticism as organic farmers of you want to turn the clock back and you want to farm like we used to when things weren't real good. And my answer to that is no, we want to go back to a fork in the road and we want to take a different path. It's not that we're going backwards. Uh, the, the problems were real. But what I've discovered was that the path we took brought it with it its own set of problems, a different set of problems. And there were better solutions to those problems than the ones that agriculture, or what we call conventional agriculture, chose to take. If we go back a little further, uh, and I'm, I'm not criticizing the scientific method, but the scientific method has taken us a long way. But there was a German philosopher in the early 1800s, uh, Goethe, who was, uh, he's considered the German Shakespeare. He was a great writer, but he was also very interested in agriculture. And he had a criticism of the scientific method that I think is really interesting looking back. He said, when you change one variable and measure one outcome, you're missing most of the picture. Because he said, when you change that one variable, you're changing the whole system. You're getting a potentially infinite number of responses, but you're only measuring one and not paying attention to them. I thought that was a really interesting early observation. A little later, there was a, a scientist, another German, uh, Justus von Liebig. And you've probably all heard about the law of the minimum, where von Liebig showed a barrel you know, and the lowest stave determines how much water it can hold. We all learn about him in school, but how many of us have read the pamphlet that was written a little later by Andre Vassan, which was called The Law of the Maximum? Vassan was criticizing von Liebig, saying that it was an impartial look at the picture and that when you have excesses in certain minerals, it can induce a shortage in other ones. So it's not just a case of putting in more and more. You need to find out why something is deficient. And I've seen many cases on my farm where we created deficiencies or created problems by not realizing that it's more about balance than about uh, mass, you know, putting on more. Uh, fast forward to the 30s and the, the Dust Bowl, and of course World War II came along, and we've all heard the story about the Haber-Bosch process, which made synthetic nitrogen, was really important for explosives. And of course, when they don't, didn't need to make explosives anymore, it was a really handy way to sell fertilizer. Well, yes, nitrogen fertilizer created a huge bump in yield. But again, there was more to the story. We were tied as farmers on the land to how much nitrogen we could fix. And we had tools. We could use manure. We could grow legumes. You know, we could manage our farms to increase the amount of nitrogen. And the nitrogen kind of controlled the production. William Albrecht made an observation. They had systems trials that started back in the 1800s. And what he observed was when they started bringing in synthetic nitrogen with no carbon. Remember, legumes, you've got carbon and nitrogen together in a in a ratio that's um, feeding the microbes but also providing carbon for their bodies. He showed that when you put just nitrogen on, it increases, it causes an explosion of microbial activity and insects and you know, all of the life in the soil. But where do they get their carbon? They have to pull it out of the organic matter that's stored there, unless you're putting carbon with the nitrogen. And that was this constraint was actually preventing us from running our organic matter down. Uh, if we go back, now, now I'm going to jerk you way back. Uh, Sir Albert Howard wrote about the Black Plague in Europe. And he made an observation about early farming. He said the plow was being used in Roman times 
to extract organic matter. That early on, wheat yields were running about 20 bushels. Uh, population was healthy and growing. Until about a thousand years ago, it had been done to the point where the population was up and they were plowing and growing wheat more often. And they were burning the organic matter out of the soil. And what happened before the yield started to drop was the nutritional quality of the crops started to drop. As the soil became unhealthy, the food became unhealthy. And then those that ate the food became unhealthy. And what Sir Albert postulated was that the reason the Black Death was so devastating was not because a microbe had come in and infected the population. It was because there was a sick population waiting and malnourished population waiting for an invader to come along. And that cut the population down. Now, if, if we look, look at the Earth like a, a single en entity, you know, maybe this was the Earth cutting down the population of humans to reestablish balance. Uh, what I have, I've noticed a lot of things in observing nature. And one of those is that nature will seek balance. Uh, there was research done by a graduate student who's now teaching at Penn State on our farm. It was Megan Chapansky, and she was studying nitrogen fixation. And she showed that the legumes would stop fixing nitrogen once the soil got to a certain point. And the, the way I was originally taught this was that legumes are like people. They're, they, only, they only work as hard as they have to. But I don't think that was quite accurate. I think really what happened is that the Earth has this natural balance, and it has feedback loops, and it tries to restore balance. And if we're farming in a way that unbalances our system, nature is going to try to rebalance it. And sometimes nature will rebalance our system in a way that we don't like. I think what we've done as conventional farmers, and I, I know I'm part of that because I farmed conventionally for 20 years, was we've developed a set of enabling technologies so that the nitrogen and the pesticides and the tools that we developed enabled us to continue management that nature was telling us was unsustainable. You know, we started having diseases, we started having insects, we saw yields start to drop because we were not creating a healthy system, and therefore we were getting pushback. And I, I think the BT corn and Roundup Ready soybeans are the ultimate enabling technology. They enabled the continuation of bad management without having yields collapse and without having the system fall apart. But it didn't change the fact that as far as the earth is concerned, that was bad management to have not enough diversity on our farms. So I'm gonna give a plug to Cornell. Uh, apologies to Madison. I think Aaron is doing a really great job here and, I, and the cooperation between Cornell and Wisconsin is to me really exciting. But when we started farming organically, it was because of markets and we went to extension and they explained to us that uh, organic might work for a couple of hippies who were growing uh, strange things in their garden, but it was totally unthinkable to do this on a field scale. It just wasn't going to work. And that was all the encouragement we needed to, t to see if it was true. <laughs> uh, I, had a, I had a real help with Mary Hall. She worked for Cornell. And when we started out, we asked two questions. One was, what did farmers use to supply fertility before 1940, when, before the synthetic fertilizers were available? And what did farmers use to kill their weeds before herbicides were available? And we went to the library, and we couldn't find any books, at least not in the front of the library, that were written before about 1950. Now, I knew they were writing books before 1950, and they were writing books about agriculture, so uh, I was ready to give up. Mary House said, stop. I know how this library is organized. So we went into the stacks, which is the old, old archives, and we started finding some old books. And I found one that forced me to reconsider some assumptions I'd made. This book was written by Dr. Bernard Rademacher. He was a German scientist. 
He was considered the guru of weeds. He lived to be 95 years old. I'd since met some of his graduate students. He, he was department chair at his university for, I think, as long as he could walk. He probably came in with a walker at the end. His son took over his position, so that was kind of a dynasty. But he was considered the world expert at one time, and he was one of the first people to do research on herbicides. I figured what he wrote about killing weeds back in 1939 would be really useful. And then I was shocked when I started reading. Or at least I was puzzled. I can still remember the line that made me stop and reread it and reread it and try to figure out what he was saying. So here's the guy that pioneered the use of herbicides, you know, who was respected all over the world, and he wrote, cultural practices form the basis of all weed control, while the various other means should be regarded as auxiliary only. And I started searching for other things that he wrote, and here this guy that's pioneered using herbicides was the most vicious critic of herbicides that I'd ever read. And the reason, and he gave his reasons. He said that these are all temporary technologies. That anything that we do to po selectively poison the plants we don't want, it's going to be a temporary fix and it's not dealing with the reason those plants are growing there. So I was asking, where do we, what are cultural practices? I mean, this is coming from someone who learned in the land grant system that everything we do, we react. You know, if we have weeds, we have to get a hoe or we have to get a, a, a sprayer or if we have a fertilizer deficiency, we have to buy fertilizer. So what are cultural practices? Now, I'm gonna take you on a side trip here. And I know with land as expensive as it is now, it's probably uh, not real common, but what would happen if you abandoned one of your prime fields of corn and did nothing this year? What would grow the first year? Lamb's quarter? Pigweed? Giant foxtail? Okay, uh, ragweed? You probably know the cast of characters, right? So some of these weeds, uh, the amaranth and the pigweed, can make 900,000 toward a million seeds. Some of the summer annual grasses can make more than a million seeds. If you abandon that field and let everything go to seed and drop, what grows the next year if you abandon it for a second year? Anyone ever seen that happen? You get a little bit of quack grass, you get a little bit of perennials, but you just dropped a million times more seed than what you had, and those species do not grow except in very small numbers the second year. Why? In my, the way I had been taught to think, if I let one weed get away, I've got a patch next year and I've got an infestation shortly after. But why, if I abandon the field and let nature take its course, do they stop growing? And of course the answer is they've changed the environment. And they've changed the environment so that the cues that made those seeds come out of dormancy and grow aren't there anymore. And the environment now favors a different group of species. So in the second year, nature is selecting what's going to grow there all by itself. If you wait five years, what do you see? Maybe your land is too good out here for that to have ever happened. <laughs> yes, you start, see, you start seeing goldenrod, but you start seeing the bushes, right? You start seeing, uh, oh, there could be hawthorn, there could be buckthorn, there will be the honey locust, there'll be th uh, thorns. Every region, it might be a little different, so you, you might have a slightly different group of species. Where we are, you start seeing the first locust coming in at that point. And then if we wait five more years, we start seeing black walnut in our environment. You all know what's going on, right? It's a su succession of species. Nature left to itself will have this succession of species and it'll go in a direction and it will end up at what's called the climax crop. And Dr. Albrecht wrote about climax crops. 
So that there's this dynamic change going on that will go in a direction and then when nature reaches equilibrium, you have a climax crop. So in eastern United States, that climax crop was hardwood forest, heavily oak, it were at least on our flat land, our rich land, and maple on the sloping land. Here, in the, if you go farther west, the climax crop was the tall grass prairie. And the buffalo were part of that, the animals were part of that ecosystem. But nature found a level that it would go to. So as farmers, what we're doing, everything we do, it's a little like saying you never swim in the same river twice. You never really farm the same field twice because everything we did there, plus the weather, changes that environment and makes it a little different, makes it best suited for something else. What Dr. Uh, Rademacher was writing about was that the cultural practices are everything that we did in that field leading up to when we plant our crop. If we were successful in creating an environment where the crop is the most adapted species, the best adapted species for those conditions, everything will work very well. It won't take much to control the weeds. You're not likely to have diseases or insects because the crop is healthy. The crop is the best adapted species. Now, I was part of a lot of meetings on soil health and we spent days arguing about what is the definition of soil health. And looking back, I think we missed it. I think what we missed is that soil health is different for an apple tree than for a corn stalk. Every species is going to have a certain set of conditions where it is best adapted. You know, and we tend to look at it like soil health is all one size fits all. And I'm, a, I'm on this board of the Soil Health Institute, so I, I don't have a problem with what we're doing in soil health, but I think as farmers, we need to expand the way we're looking at, at the term. When we uh, started farming organically on a big scale in our area, Cornell came to us, some of the researchers who were, we were working with, and they wanted to do a organic transition uh, plot on the Cornell farm, which was really in response to farmers asking for help in learning how to do a better job, getting good recommendations, getting good information, which was really hard to find back in the 1990s. And I really have to applaud the researchers we were working with. They were looking at what practices are working on the farms in New York, and they tried very hard to make the organic systems trial at the university reflect accurately what was happening in the fields, what was actually happening on the organic farms. And they, part of that was bringing in a group of farmers to be an advisory uh, committee so that the decisions that were made would be in line with the real decisions that would happen on real organic farms. Now, this created a few challenges because experimental design says you, you design your experiment and you don't change it. Well, that's not reality on organic farms. We have to learn to adapt. And we actually adapt from year to year. Uh, one of the really good things that happened, because it so closely reflected our farms, the systems trial had the same problems pop up at exactly the same points that we had had when we were first learning how to farm. Only now, instead of just muddling through it, we had disciplined researchers and technicians gathering data and explaining what was happening. The first real big hurdle we ran into uh, was accelerated a little bit. Uh, I'll digress here and say that the, the manager of the Cornell farm was a very conventional-minded person, and he took a field they had that was poorly drained, that was fouled with weeds, that he wasn't able to get good conventional crops on, and that became the organic farm. And I, I actually challenged him on it, and he, had, he didn't disagree. He admitted he'd done that. But uh, that said, the organic farm did very well. But the first big problem we ran into was we had a system that was corn followed by soybeans, followed by either wheat or spelt, some winter grain, underseeded with clover, and then back to corn. So we had four species, three years. And after, that was actually quite successful, but after about three cycles, we noticed a huge increase in the number of perennial weeds, especially Canada thistle. 
In fact, it, the Canadian thistle got to the point where the yields of the winter grain were really collapsing. Now, we had had that happen on our farm a little bit ahead of that, and we were doing a lot of experimenting. I did a lot of research on Canadian thistle. So I'm going to fast forward and give you the clip notes of what happened. Uh, I had suggested that instead of staying with that system, we follow the winter wheat with winter barley. And then we follow, we double crop the winter barley, we, uh, subsoil, and then put a second uh, crop in of buckwheat, although we could use Sudan sorghum, uh, we could use dry beans at that point, or even soybeans, because barley is harvested early enough. But for simplicity, uh, we use buckwheat, and also because buckwheat is a great weed suppressor. And I remember my, my good friend, who's my, my good late friend, he passed away, unfortunately, uh, listened to what I said, and he said, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, you have no idea what, how big the reserves are in the roots of those thistles. And just making one change for one year is not going to have any impact on them. They're going to shake it off and be right back. That fall, um, when Brian Caldwell, who's now on National Organic Standards Board, was, do, was managing the plots, he said, we're now rid of our perennial weeds, and we can go back to the original plan. Only the farmers said, why would we go back to the original plan? That caused the weeds. So we left a more diverse system. And that was the first step in a long process that has taught me that whenever we have a really big intractable agronomic problem, we can generally solve it instead of by saying, let's kill this species, by adding diversity to the farm that rebalances our biology, and then the species stops being a pest. And that, that has happened. I can give you, uh, it, you don't have time, or, and I would bore you to death with how many cases we've had where by adding one new species to our farming system at the right point, we eliminated a major problem. And I'll give you a quick example, which is not a good one, that happened not on our farm, but in uh, the Salinas Valley in California. They had a problem there with uh, an aphid that made the heart of romaine lettuce slimy so that it was unmarketable. And they weren't able to grow organic romaine lettuce because there was no material that would kill that aphid. Uh, what they found was that if you planted 44 sweet alyssum flowers per acre, one every thousand square feet, that romaine lettuce had no aphids. Add one species, get rid of one problem. So the, the general principle is held for me, and it's held over and over, that when we have a pest, it really is a symptom of an imbalanced biology. Now, I'll give you one more story on this. And all of these stories actually point out how dense I was. I had to unlearn things I had assumptions in my head that I didn't realize were assumptions. I had to back up and re recalibrate my thinking. And these unrecognized assumptions are sometimes barriers that keep us from understanding the problem and then keep us from solving the problem. Uh, I'll give you another uh, quip on this, and that is I was working for, as a consultant, for one of the richest people on Wall Street at one point. Uh, the guy was a jerk. He was very proud. He said, I don't have stress. I cause it. <laughs> but, and he wanted to have an organic farm. And uh, when he first called, he, he started out telling how rich he was and how important he was. And Mary Howe picked up the phone. And she said, yeah, but we don't need any of your money, and hung up. <laughs> 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 he called again, and she hung up again. <laughs> he called a third time and said, there will be an airplane at the Penyon Airport. Why don't you get on it? <laughs> he sent a private airplane. <laughs> but he was a consultant in the financial world. And he said the most important thing for a consultant to do to be of any value to their client is to learn to ask the right question. And I think that's, that's an important lens to help shape our thinking. If we have a problem in the field, what is the first question that comes to mind if we have a new pest? 
I would guess it's how do I kill it? Is that right? Is that the right question? And the other thing this guy told me was getting the right answer to the wrong question doesn't benefit anybody. <laughs> so if how do I kill it is not the best question, what is the, the right question when we have a new, when we have a problem, we have a pest? Why is it there? That is a, that's a profound question though, and it goes a lot deeper. I will add another quote that came from William Albrecht. He used to tell his students that they needed to learn to see what they were looking at. That's another one of those things that sounds obvious, but there's a lot more depth to that statement than what meets the eye. So when we first started farming organically with this corn, soybeans, uh, we were using spelt instead of wheat with clover. We had one field that I wasn't sure I would ever be able to farm organically. It had velvet leaf that would get 12 to 15 feet tall. It was the old barnyard of where there had been a dairy farm. And the first year, I ended up harvesting one acre with a hay bine. There was nothing but velvet leaf there. Three years later, when I was back into corn, I was congratulating myself for doing such a masterful job of cultivating that we actually got a crop. If we want to skip ahead about into the third cycle, uh, I had a pretty good crop. And we had a field day in the, at that time. Uh, and it was in cooperation with Cornell and Cooperative Extension and uh, NOFA New York. And we had several hundred farmers came and we went to that field and we were discussing how we got ahead of the velvet leaf. And there was a consultant there, a conventional consultant. And he said, come over here and look at this. You're not gonna have a crop by the end of the week. And he said, look at all these white flies. And the, the field was a cloud of white flies. And I said, well, are any of them on the corn? And we looked, and there wasn't a single white fly on the corn. They were all over the velvet leaf. And they didn't seem to have any interest in the corn. Uh, the other thing we noticed when we were there was the velvet leaf was dying. The bottom leaves had all fallen off. The middle leaves had turned yellow. The ones in between were brown. And the plants really didn't look very healthy. They were a lot smaller than they had been. And I suddenly had an idea. I could be a millionaire. We'll have to catch the spores from whatever is the disease here and then sell it to people so they can put it on their velvet leaf and get rid of their velvet leaf. So I called my friend Tony DiTomaso at Cornell. And he said, well, what you've got going on here, you've got the, the white flies, but you've also got a, a disease, which is velvet leaf anthracnose. And it's a specific race of anthracnose that will kill hollyhocks and mallow and velvet leaf, but nothing else. So that made it a perfect candidate for a biopesticide. But Tony said, you've got a great idea except for one thing. And he pointed across the road and said, that's conventional corn. It has all the same things in it, but it's not hurting the velvet leaf. So you're going to have to explain why it works here and it doesn't work over there. A little later, uh, we had a graduate student who was doing some work and he identified a virus that was albutian yellows. And I kept thinking, well, maybe we need to have the, the fungus and the insect and the virus, all three, to kill this weed. I, I was totally wrong. What I believe now, and I'm pretty, I'm not, I haven't proven it scientifically, but I'm 99% sure I'm right is that velvet leaf was suffering from a disease, a virus disease, a fungal disease, and an insect because it was sick. It wasn't sick because it had the diseases in the insects. And I've got some evidence for that. Uh, to this day, we can find velvet leaf coming up in relatively big numbers, but you pull it out and it has almost no roots. Originally, when we had velvet leaf, it had roots so powerful that I couldn't pull them out. So th this velvet leaf is obviously there because there's a legacy of huge weed seed bank, you know, so that there's some coming, but it's not happy with how it grows. So that, that was, to me, quite an informative lesson. 
And I don't know yet what about what we changed in the system that made the valve leaf no longer be happy there other than we weren't using synthetic fertilizers or herbicides anymore. So now I'm going to share a few observations that we've made that have been helpful. And that's, I believe that nature will teach us if we patiently look at a field and try to see what we're looking at. So if we have a new weed, quite often um, we don't think about it spatially. It's just there and it's bothering us. But if we step back, normally that weed was, will grow in a pattern. You know, is it growing at the high spots? Is it growing in the low spots? Is it at the edge of the field? You know, what we need to start asking these questions about where did this thing start and where is it growing best? We need to think about what, what happened here before. Can we make any connections? And I believe this is a process, this should be the beginning of our asking the right question, is make every observation we possibly can about this pest. But instead of asking, how do I kill it? Or where are its weak spots? We need to ask, what is it about the ecology and the environment in, this, in these fields that is making this species suddenly become the best adapted species here? You know, what have we done here in the past that might be setting us up for this problem in the future. And also, what is this thing doing as part of our ecosystem? You know, it's probably doing something because it's changing the soil. What I have noticed is that these flushes, and it, it's pretty common all through nature, if we have a new insect, do you all remember the soybean aphid? A few years back? It, we weren't going to be able to grow soybeans anymore unless we used neonicotinoids because there was such a big problem with soybean aphids. Anyone had a problem with soybean aphids in the last five, six years? Even where we're not using neonicotinoids, we don't have them. We, there's some there, but they're not causing the kind of losses that we had. Normally in nature, we have epidemics that cut through and they're like a wave and they're really, really bad when they come and we think it's, this is the end of it. You know, we're just not going to be able to deal with it. And then things kind of moderate. Nature usually brings on some of its own biocontrols. You know, we just don't have these things just keep getting worse and worse. I had an uh, interesting talk with Vandana Shiva years ago, and she made an interesting observation. She was talking about the stock market. And she said, does anything healthy grow at the rate the stock market grows? This was ahead of one of the busts back in the, uh, we had that big bust in 2008 and she was looking at the run up and said, the only thing in nature that grows like the stock market are cancers, diseases, insect plagues. And she was saying we could learn from that. Nature doesn't allow that kind of growth. Which I think learning from nature in that way is interesting. We can mimic, we can see how it works. Another thing that I've learned is that nature is not efficient. You ever thought about that? Nature is abundant, but efficiency is putting in less and taking out more. So are a million pollen grains efficient for one seed? You know, are, are a million apple blossoms efficient when you're only going to have a few thousand apples? But it's abundant and it's resilient. And I, I think we need to learn the difference between absolute high yield and a resilient, safe food system. Because if those high yields are being supported by a very few outside inputs, the system actually is brittle. And I'm stealing this idea from your former dean, uh, Molly. As I heard her give a brilliant talk at a conference where she described our system as productive but not resilient. You know, this, this is all kind of background for learning how to look at our system differently. I think we're, we tend to look at practices, and this, I think this could instruct us on how we go ahead in the future. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're all supposed to be putting cover crops on to improve soil health. But I don't think a single, pra a good practice added to a bad system is a problem solver. If you have an unsustainable system, we need to change the system. And there may be a lot of good practices 
that are used for making the system more sustainable. But it's really the system that we need to be looking at, not the individual practice. And we're doing a really good job of that, I think, with our, our no-till program, where we're, we're learning that we have to build a system, not just an individual practice. So how are we doing on time? Okay, I probably need to leave 10 for... Okay, so I'm gonna, now I'm gonna do some of the fun stuff. Uh, this picture shows some of, the, some of the crops that we're looking at. Because along with how nature becomes more resilient when it's more diverse, we have found that our farm becomes economically more resilient when it has a more diverse set of crops. If we have a disaster in the weather, I've never yet seen it wipe out every crop we grow. In fact, there's usually a few crops that do really good, even when other ones are devastated. You know, when we have these really bad summer droughts, our winter grains all do great, and harvest is easy. So that's just a quick example of that. But we've found that there are crops that fit almost every extreme in nature. And if we can learn how those crops fit into these systems, it'll actually complement what we learn about our weeds. Because if we can learn what the weeds are telling us about our soil, that could maybe be a hint as to how to build a cropping system and which crops are going to do well. And there's some interesting uh, metadata work been done at Cornell by Dr. Van Ness, where he could take the soil health test results, the numerical results, on a big scale, and he could predict what crop would be the best yielding crop, you know, using big data. Now, that, this is a very crude tool, but he's already shown that it can be done. Now, a farmer walking the fields can do this a whole lot more efficiently. We don't need the, the massive data because we're farming locally and we can make these observations. My son noticed several years ago that when we had um, triticale and Austrian winter peas as a forage that we harvested, we had almost no weed pressure for the next two to three weeks afterwards. In fact, back when we were uh, planting uh, black beans after the triticale and winter peas, we would harvest the triticale uh, chop it for forage, we'd plow the field, plant black beans, and one year, I think we were three weeks before we saw the first weed. The black beans by then were up and running, and we had weed-free fields. Now, it's not always gonna work that way, but that, that uh, observation is important because if we can have a sequence where we know that this previous crop has reduced weed pressure, it really stacks the deck in our favor, especially if we're growing a crop that is not real competitive with weeds. Climate change is giving us some challenges that I think can, we can turn lemons into lemonade with. Uh, I've talked with quite a few people here about uh, oats and buckwheat. Now buckwheat in New York had a niche at one time. We had a lot of cold valleys, uh, relatively poor soil, and the farmers learned that if you watch the full moon, and planted the buckwheat, usually, and I can't tell you exactly how they timed it with the moon in July, they would get a frost either in late August or early September that froze the buckwheat and terminated it. And they could then direct cut it with a combine about five days later, made harvest real easy. Well, we, we had our first frost this year, the 14th of November. That system doesn't work. So the climate niche that buckwheat filled has gone. It's probably somewhere up in Ontario. I hope the farmers there enjoy it. But it opened up another niche for buckwheat. So what we found now is our wheat's harvested enough earlier, and buckwheat can be planted after wheat as a no-till double crop. And we had 100 acres of buckwheat planted after winter grain this year on our farm. It added $200 an acre profit to the winter grain crop. It occupied a niche when the field would have otherwise been laying bare. You know, as it was, we were improving the soil health 
Uh, the buckwheat does some amazing things. Uh, buckwheat roots give off strong acids that are able to break the bonds between phosphorus and aluminum and between phosphorus and iron. I have once had a, a teacher, one, one of my really good agronomy teachers when I was in college, uh, had some fun with us. We were in a lab class and he pulled a sample where the phosphorus was going to test zero. He did that because we were learning to test phosphorus and he wanted to see who was going to try to cheat. So all these tests were coming up zero and everybody was going crazy trying to figure out what were we doing wrong, why aren't we getting results. And then he came clean and told us what he'd done. And he said, there's a simple test that'll tell you this. And he said, you spit in it because there's phosphorus in your saliva and then, then you know that your test was okay. But he said, now, how would you grow a crop on this land? And of course, everyone said, put on fertilizer. And he said, that may not be the best way to do this. This land is, I, he took this from a building site where thing, nothing really wanted to grow. But he said, you could plant buckwheat on this. And after the buckwheat is harvested, you're going to have phosphorus available. So this is, this is an interesting case of bioremediation, but buckwheat will make phosphorus available. It has organisms in the root system that will hunt down and kill pathogens. All the old farmers in our area, if they had quack grass, would rotate to one crop of buckwheat. And they knew after they grew the buckwheat, the quack grass would be gone. You know, this is one of these magic plants in terms of what it's able to do in the system. Now, these are all great tools to use if we've observed them and know that it works. Uh, we've had a couple generations that have kind of stopped using those tools. Uh, oats is an interesting crop. We talk about the markets here, and we're not getting the good markets for corn and soybeans that we would like. Uh, I, I'm guessing you have people here that buy oats, like from grain millers or uh, Quaker, maybe. But they're not able to find oats anymore in sufficient quantities because the zone for growing spring oats has moved north. Uh, the best spring oats now grows in northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan, far, far from where the markets are. So our spring oats zone has moved north, just like the buckwheat zone has moved north. But you know there was a winter oat zone that used to be south of us a little ways. And I believe it's moved up to us now. The winter oats could be an interesting crop because it will have much higher test weight, it'll be higher quality. And maybe we could be selling that winter oats to Quaker because they want oatmeal. And maybe it would even bring a little better premium or be an interesting alternative. I, I would, I love to be in the marketing position if someone's offering me a lousy price that I don't like that I could tell them, well, maybe I just won't grow that this year. I've got another crop that's more profitable. And if you have a really diverse system and you're not real dependent on one crop, it puts you in a much more powerful negotiating position uh, with your marketing. So what I've noticed was we started seeing oats surviving in our wheat. And since I brought this up at meetings, I've had more farmers come to me and said, you know, I've seen that. Sometimes a little oats survives through the winter. And we started selecting that oats, uh, cleaning it out of the wheat, and planting it. And uh, we planted it back. Last winter, we had a freak winter. We got down, we were, had two spells when we got below zero. Uh, one time it was seven below, and there was bare soil, not a bit of snow. And we had a high wind. And it really decimated that winter oat breeding plot that I had. But you know what survived is pretty tough stuff. And I saved back the seed from it. <laughs> we planted it last, here last fall, this past fall. And you're, uh, you're gonna have a couple pictures coming up shortly on it. And I no-tilled it into buckwheat that had been double cropped after a winter grain. And what I noticed uh, from my reading is that epigenetics really works. This is not just Mendelian genetics. There are genes in the plants that can be turned on by environmental conditions. And if there's a strong stress that doesn't quite kill the plant, that stress is inherited into the next generation. So the way plants deal with cold is they increase the amount of sugars in the sap, they increase the amount of minerals, 
and that makes them, protects them from freezing. There's a field of winter oats that was 10 degrees Fahrenheit when I took that. That was planted in buckwheat stubble, no-till. And it had also, uh, the leaves had dried. A lot of the moisture had gone out of those leaves, so it really concentrated the sugars that were in, uh, in the tops. And it looks kind of wildy. And I was wondering, how, you know, how bad is the damage going to be when we're done? And in a little bit, you're going to see a picture of that field, uh, what it looked like a few days later when it warmed up. Uh, in my selection, you know, going through the fields, uh, I noticed all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, this is one plant. I counted roughly 2,000 seeds on that plant. That was a plant that had survived the winter. It's amazing what we see in our fields if we really look and if we really observe. And this particular uh, plant, was a, there was a variety called Storm King. The oats are all hanging on one side of the stem. This variety was uh, worked with by a Cornell graduate student back in 2004. And he must have lost some, some of the germplasm on our farm. And it was hanging out <laughs> until I saw it. Uh, I've saved all those seeds and replanted them, so we're going to have a good look at it. Uh, they, they seem to survive zero temperatures. Uh, this is the field after, the, after it warmed up, the one that was in the cold conditions. I don't think there was any damage to those leaves at all yet. So I think there's potential there for us. Uh, so I'm, I'm just throwing these out as ideas, but it's so much fun to market when you're the only game in town. Uh, we've learned that winter lentils grow in New York. And winter lentils are another crop that there's a big food demand for. And we kind of, kind of didn't know how to price it because there's no competition. Uh, we're also experimenting with chickpeas, uh, big demand for them. Uh, this is buckwheat. This is a variety called dietka. It was a Ukrainian variety. I planted this field on the 22nd of August. It actually made a crop. The reason I planted it so late was it took me that long to get the seed. And I, I just wasn't going to not plant it after all that effort and time to get the seed. But we've found that we could direct cut this without a frost because it, it's a determinate variety. There's genetics in Ukraine, and this is a Ukrainian variety that will make them bloom all at once and set seed all at once. The reason for the problems we had where we needed the frost was that buckwheat will set a bunch of blossoms, set seed, and then make more blossoms and set seed, and then the first seeds are already falling off and it's still setting more blossoms, and somebody needs to stop that process. So I think I better, pro better stop and see if there are any questions. As you can probably guess, the, this experimenting we do is like putting a kid in a candy shop for me. Microphone's <laughs> on. Hello? Okay. What zone are you? So we're in zone six. Okay, you're six. And then with the, with the buckwheat, when you did August 22nd, you didn't have a first frost till November? Yeah, well, our first frost came in November. We're, we're near mm -hmm. the lake, but this was a exceptionally warm. I, this is something I shouldn't have got away with. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> I used to have an employee who said, you ought to be arrested for getting away with that when we had luck like this. <laughs> this is, you're really interesting because we do so much experimenting on our farm too and doing different things, but we had a field day, uh, oh, a number of different times, Aaron knows, but this one thing, time uh, before the field day, uh, I was cutting hay, and, and the hay was beautiful. I mean, this was two years ago, and last year it was too, but the alfalfa was just beautiful, but an older guy like me, I have to get out and stretch, you know, and, and so I got out, and the dispens got these big platforms on it, and I get out, and 
There are thousands and thousands of insects and bugs and worms. And I started counting them, and there was, I, I got up to 28 different kinds of insects, 15 different kinds of worms. I mean, that was just, and the hay was beautiful. I even took a picture of it, and we, we ran it at the, and everybody thought I was nuts, but that's, that's okay. But, you, you know, what, all these insects, and the crops are great. All these bugs and the crops are, the, the crops are great. So uh, you're seeing what you're looking at, right? Yeah. <laughs> why would we I kill mean, them? And yeah, you're actually. Why, <laughs> why, why do we kill them and we still got great crops? Yeah. So uh, you're ac actually asking the right question. There's a similar story. Uh, there's a book that you might want to read called Weedy Weeds, Guardians of the Soil by uh, William Kochenauer. And what he, what Kochenauer wrote was that his job was hoeing purslane out of corn when he was a teenager. And he noticed after a while that the corn was always best where the purslane was the heaviest. And he started asking, is there some connection? You know, is the purslane maybe helping the corn? Or are the corn and the purslane both doing so well because the soil's better? But he also asked the question is, why am I trying so hard to kill this when this is where the corn's doing the best? <laughs> so that's the, I think that's the kind of questions we need to learn to ask. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> I will suggest that uh, you might have an opportunity here, and you really have a great university to work with, but what, what really accelerated research at Cornell was we have a group of farmers who meet and ask this kind of questions. And we have, this year we're having two meetings uh, in the winter. There used to be three or four. I think we're going to go back to more meetings but it was called New York Certified Organic, and we would invite conventional farmers, researchers, extension people, anyone who wanted to come. There, everybody would bring some food. Uh, Cornell gave us a venue to work in, and the t uh, tables are set in a circle so that we're all, it's not like somebody like me pontificating to everybody else. It's kind of a more of a circle discussion. You know, and there's nobody who's been in, a, who's a, been in the field and seen something who's not able to contribute something that's valuable to everybody else. And in that setting, we have had ideas for research projects that's, that have made major breakthroughs. Uh, we have had machines talked about and developed that have really worked. Uh, we have had just an amazing no amount of progress has been made. That organization now is in the second generation. There's some people here that from New came to New York with me who are the uh, offspring of some of the founders of NYCO who are now running it still. And I, th I think you might have a real opportunity here to work with Aaron and st okay. start doing that kind of thing. I think we could definitely do if there's interest in it. Um, several years ago, I read uh, the Dan Barber book, and I believe they talked about the wheat from your farm that, and made bread. And it looked like, are you, can you talk about, was that, Emmer and Einkorn? Yes. And then are you milling and doing, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so the ancient grains are something I got interested in. Emmer, um, in the genetics of wheat, the first grain ever uh, cultivated by humans was Einkorn. And it's a diploid. And for people that have dietary problems, um, Einkorn is the most easily, it's got the lowest glycemic index of any grain and it's the most easily digested uh, grain that's out there that still has gluten. So if you have celiac disease, it's still a problem. But people that are just intolerant or people who have other issues with wheat can generally eat einkorn. Uh, the first um, use of einkorn is according to a friend of mine who actually collected einkorn. The einkorn we raised was from some of her accessions, said was in, uh, used for making beer. That it was a, they, they discovered that this grain could be fermented in the hulls. It was a hulled grain like spelt. And they, one of the theories of how the first city started might, was that they would go to places where this, these wild grains were growing and they would harvest all the grain and make beer. And when the beer was gone, they would go back out. And that every year they would come together to raise the grain. And that at one point there was an accident and bread was an accident that happened when you put yeast and grain together that occurred when they were making beer. 
So I don't know for sure if that's true, but it's a really nice story. <laughs> but uh, these uh, ancient grains t seem to be easier to digest, you know, and they're healthier. And we have done really well uh, growing some of them. Uh, spelt is actually a modern wheat, but it's an older kind. And we have a market for spelt where some people are intolerant of wheat, not because of gluten, but because of the amylase trypsin inhibitor. It's one of the enzymes in it. There are some other enzymes in modern wheat that are there because in larger amounts because it's been, modern wheat was crossed with rye at one point, And we picked up some allergens uh, from the, the same genes, the same source that created the higher yields and the better agronomics brought with it some dietary problems. Also, there's been a change in our culture that grains always were sourdoughed. Well, the sourdoughing process breaks down some of these allergens. But our modern uh, industrial process for making bread, it's a lot more efficient to put yeast in it and make it real quick. You know, and that way some of the amylase trypsin inhibitor doesn't get broken down. And people who are intolerant of it, eventually, if, you're, if your body is assaulted by something that it's not completely tolerant of long enough, it develops into something bigger. So that uh, Bob Quinn, who... Uh, has uh, the label for Kamut, financed some research in Europe, and they found that these old grains have a much lower tendency to cause inflammation in the body than our modern grains do. So there, there's some real opportunities with them. Everything is a learning experience. Uh, what we found with einkorn, it, it looked really great if we planted it early enough, and it just made a beautiful lawn. And then when we went to combine it, it didn't make much grain. When we planted it real late, it looked like there was nothing there. The next spring, we were pulling our hair out, should we go plow it? And a week later, it was five feet tall and made a crop. We actually found that einkorn does better if it's planted late, doesn't grow too well, and then makes most of its growth the next spring. We've learned that barley makes its best yield and best quality on fall growth. And that's instructing us on when you plant things. So the f first grain that we will plant on our farm is generally barley because we need the fall growth. Then we will go to wheat. It can do well on either fall or spring growth, particularly if you have fertility. Uh, then we'll go to spelt. Spelt does much better on f spring growth. I've had spelt do the same thing as the einkorn, where we're looking at it and saying, wow, we're going to have 200 bushel spelt. And then have about a third that in the bin. But when we plant it late enough, it does better. So this is all observation. It's all local. Uh, it still has to survive the winter, so it has to have enough size to, to do that. But uh, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on about these ancient grains, but the, the, what I'm describing is how they can fit into a system and also how they can fit into marketing. So we became good friends with Danny Wegman, who owns the chain uh, Wegmans, and we became even better friends with his baker and they selected, uh, they flew out to Washington, my son went with them, and selected a variety of wheat to make the, their artisan bread. And it's a variety called Rainon that we are the exclusive grower for. But that does, that's kind of beside the point other than we were able to make quite a lucrative market for ourselves for this special variety of wheat. But I think there are opportunities here for growing wheat and selling it as a varietal. Uh, Mary Howell once, many years ago, when we were roguing seed wheat, asked me a question that made me look like a fool. She asked, how does this stuff taste? And I said, well, wheat's wheat. It all tastes like wheat. And she didn't believe me. So she brought home a little bit of each of three varieties and ground them and tasted them. And sure enough, one of them tasted pretty bad. It was nothing you'd get excited about. Another one was... I would say was better, you know, something you'd want to eat. And the third one, she described it as tasting like sunshine. What we found was the, the bran in the wheat has a, has a flavor, and it can be a good flavor or a bad flavor. And when we mix everything, we're incentivizing, we're actually uh, making pe people who are growing better quality, better flavor when everything is mixed, they're the fools because they get rewarded exactly the same as the one who's doing something Half, kind of halfway. So I think we have opportunities here in the organic world 
to sell varietals. You know, how, how neat would it be if your store could say what farms were growing something and what variety the, bread, the wheat was from? And that's worked for us. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't have a monopoly on these ideas. There, there's a room full of people here who could go out and you could be building your own markets and make a food culture that's exciting and fun. Well, we can keep brainstorming over lunch. Uh, let's thank Klaus again.